Okay, uh, greetings everyone and welcome to the uh, second day of the School for Politics and Critique 2022. Uh, we're going to begin this day off by, with a lecture by Amelia Lewison, um, who you can see either in person or through the stream here, obviously. Um, so she'll talk for an hour and then have a Q&A immediately uh, following. So if you're ready to go. Um, okay. Um, hi everyone, I'm Amalia. Um, I'm currently doing my PhD in Australia, researching how to stop philosophy from reinstating anthropocentric cosmologies um, in an age where we really need to confront the reality of the Anthropocene, so rather than fantasies. Um, to do this, I'm using um, Katerina over his um, scientific method to try and strip Rose's notion of progress from its humanism. Um, and I'm actually spending a couple of months in Skopje to do this or to get some help with this. So this talk discusses how Gillian Rose's unusual notion of progress can offer a piece of the puzzle in enabling enlightenment thought to progress past its own limits. Um, so in 1947, at Dornenhochheimer, largely in response to Nazi fascism and the Holocaust, observed that while Enlightenment progress promised freedom, society at the same time saw the rise of unfree dominating structures, such as unthinking consumer culture and fascism, or in other words, reversion to myth. Enlightenment regression remains as relevant as ever. While modern progress pushes forward, we continue to see regression to destruction and myth, undermining its own projects of freedom, democracy, truth, and innovation. Reading the dialectic of enlightenment in the age of the Anthropocene highlights how we're not just dealing with regression as a form of domination. The desire to dominate nature turns out to be a form of thanatosis, where enlightenment is regressing back to a lifeless state. Um, a sort of death drive to extinction. On top of this, people seem to be unable to properly comprehend or critique this drive to extinction. So we can kind of recognize that it's happening, but we can't really grapple with its gravity. So in this context, rational scientific thought continues to present a double-edged sword. Um, so on the one hand, science is crucial for addressing environmental degradation because it exposes the reality of climate collapse. Um, science has always been a reliable source for capturing the reality of the world. Um, and climate science also presents a challenge to human-centric narratives in the way it invites humanity to imagine an earth both before and after us. Um, so we're not quite as significant as we like to think. Um, and we're also not invincible. Um, so humanity relies on particular geological and biological conditions to survive on Earth. However, on the other hand, rational thought continues to follow the Enlightenment's blind confidence that human ingenuity can overcome all natural limits. So it remains unreflexive about its own implication in environmental destruction. And while there's a chance that human mastery could save us, um, there's also a chance it could just accelerate this drive to extinction. Um, so they're kind of high-risk gambles, which we see in examples like geoengineering. It also doesn't really confront the root of the problem, um, which is that rational thought at its most fundamental still positions nature instrumentally, um, although it's not exactly um, science's job to confront this. So philosophy, unfortunately, hasn't contributed constructively to this predicament. Um, it has not tried to address the destructive undertone of progress or rational thought. And rather than confronting the realities exposed by science, philosophy has reinstated new myths that shelter the psyche from grappling with extinction, um, as well as the kind of existential questions that come with it. So it kind of is working to distract the population rather than confront reality. So I think that philosophy should really be asking how it can help science um, rather than undermining its achievements. So part of the reason um, 
for its inability to help science is that, with a few exceptions, philosophy remains stuck in a traumatic aversion to enlightenment thought. Rose, who was writing in the 80s to early 90s, was one of the first theorists to warn of the devastating political effects of postmodernism's rejection of enlightenment thought, um, long before the more recent critiques of it. Rose showed how, in a move of unreflexive resentment, postmodernism internalized and flipped the transcendental structure of enlightenment philosophy, merely reinstating its authoritarian structure in inverted form, um, while also stripping the left of resources to either exploit or challenge enlightenment progress. So in the wake of World War II, postmodernism, the postmodern term blamed enlightenment thought for producing the conditions that made the horrors of the Holocaust possible. So here the Holocaust was judged as the imminent telos of metaphysical principles, progress, reason, universalism, and the law. Progress, it was argued, consumed all particularity into its advance, destroying everything in its path. Universalism or collectivity was deemed as necessarily hegemonic, signifying the consumption of all heterogeneity into homogeneity, um, including the difference between particular lives. Metaphysics was said to signify the truth of the powerful at the exclusion of the others. And most of all reason was judged as the determining force of all these ills, positioning the world instrumentally and stripping the world of meaning. So the postmodern response to the Holocaust didn't work through its trauma and instead was one of resentment and melancholia. So resentment refers to a process of the powerless taking on the opposite characteristics of their aggressor when the power dynamics shift. So the formerly powerless don't want to correct the traits of their aggressor, um, just mark them as evil and themselves as good. In the wake of the Shoah, postmodernism was quick to establish, establish themselves as innocent by assuming the opposite identity to modern theory. Um, so in the place of universality, we find particularity. Instead of principles or metaphysics, we find fluid subversion. Objectivity is replaced by subjectivity. And the white heterosexual male is replaced by all those he excluded. Um, so this is a quote. The once perennial master, reason, with his ambivalence of desire and fear, has at long last been subdued. The implication arises that woman, the body, love, released from the rationality of man, the mind, logic, are no longer equivocal. So this new postmodern ethics set out to be determinately nonviolent. Um, and with their newfound righteousness, so there was nothing left to do but expel any remnants of enlightenment violence from its conceptual city. Um, and these days we see it happening in the real city as well. Melancholia, which complements resentment, marks a refusal to let go. Often in melancholia, the lost item is a fantasy rather than a real loss. And the mourner develops their identity around that loss, so that to let go of the loss would mean to sacrifice the self. Um, so you can't really let go. This means that postmodern ethics couldn't move past the trauma of the Holocaust because their very identity was developed in response to it. Um, as a result, postmodernism fell into an internal melancholia, lamenting the idea of freedom of a freedom from violence that never actually existed. Um, so postmodernism's melancholy, mel melancholic despair was further cemented by discarding the political resources that could allow it to move past its lament. So it tried to shelter political resistance from any implication of violence by finding an ethical solution to the problem of politics. Um, or as Rose puts it, replacing communism with community. A non-representational, non-institutional, non-intentional approach was developed to avoid any exclusion of the other but these aspirations of completed inclusion actually resulted in the erosion of political capability by expending with debate, institutional change, and new interpretations of universality and solidarity that are all crucial to lasting political change. Without principles, how can anyone take a stand in politics, she asks. 
without reason, how can anyone judge the success or failures of political ventures or assess the difference between opinions? Um, without debate, how can anyone challenge the postmodern or post-structural claim of reality? So this is a quote. We need to be able to represent, to formalize, to think, to know, to judge all the activities from which messianic destruct deconstruction would disqualify us. So it left the left um, only with the capacity to despair at our conditions. Um, and it gave birth to an economy of suffering. Rose criticized this turn because it actually legitimized violence passively by leaving its citizens exposed to unchallenged state violence and to capitalist progress. But it was also violent in the way that it um, formed a prescriptive totality um, that was unable to reflect on its own limits. So despite its want um, to free society of domination, post-structuralist theory support only one totalizing conception of reality, so it's kind of linguistic power relations, and one vision of ethics. Their totality disseminated culturally rather than with the force of universalism, but its oppressive exclusions and authoritarian character were the same. On top of this, its self-perceived innocence facilitated a relentless purification of its imagined world. While they saw themselves as innocent and non-violent, they endorsed violence in pursuing purity and were all the more dangerous because they were already ready to exploit the suffering or their suffering for the sake of the good. So it doesn't matter if your intentions are good, if you can't reflect on how your beliefs are implicated in exclusions and violence. Um, so it's a sort of philosophical illiberalism um, that emerges from being unwilling to confront the real. This is a quote. Um, the newly achieved franchise imparts a fixity to them, even if or precisely when they are defined as fluid. For even if exclusive and excluding reason was in the wrong, then exclusive otherness will be equally so. Certainty does not empower, it subjugates. Rose died in early death in 1995, um, before the rise of identity politics um, in its current form. But I think she would have been horrified to see her warnings come true to the extent that they have today. So today, today we can see the success of the cultural overcoming of politics, um, which now dominates much of the mainstream left, um, at least in Australia and places like America. Post-structuralism self-referential norms have become the status quo manifesting in both expected and unexpected ways. And it's a totality so complete that we can't even hint at questioning its authority without becoming the enemy. Theoretically speaking, post-structuralism has since been replaced by a paradigm shift to new materialisms and new ontologies that emerged from a concern for the political limits of linguistic theorizing given the more material nature of contemporary problems like environmental degradation. While these theories have returned to questions of matter and ontology, they've merely succeeded in expanding the post-structural conception of the world to the material realm, arguing that the world is not just constituted by linguistic relations, but the co-constitution of meaning and matter. In these accounts, every part of the universe is conceived as connected into a network of entang entangled material becoming. However, they have not changed the post-structural foundation, so threatening to further embed its problem. Um, and I'm applying Katarina's critique of philosophical worlds here. These accounts are merely new transcendentalisms masquerading as materialisms. In other words, there remain philosophical interpretations of matter that still replace the real and refuses any openness to how the real might contradict or challenge its conception. New ontologies and new materialisms still make a decision about the nature of reality according to a transcendental doctrine that defines reality as fluid, plural, and constructed, and then place that places that decision over reality. This means that rather than grappling with the real exposed by climate events, and the lack of control that humanity has over these events. New ontologies or new materialisms domesticate and subjectivize nature by projecting human traits onto nature 
Um, so on their account, Nature and Meta are actively participating in our symbolic cosmology. Um, and also by finding continuity with this abstract conceptualization of nature. Um, so we're already entangled with and codefined by nature. Envisioning nature in this way, in a sort of shadow of ourselves, makes the real feel familiar and safe. And it also projects a sort of um, reinstated sense of control over nature because we've already determined and understand nature's nature. This subjectivized account of matter is then harnessed for renewed ethics that positions nature and matter as mere resources for a new human purpose, a kind of new ethical responsibility over nature or a new system of pure value. Finding meaning in this way ignores any challenge to human centrality that may emerge from science or climate events. These abstract worlds um, recenter the human because their very construction is dedicated to giving human purpose, um, meaning that they prioritize sustaining this human fantasy of purpose over understanding the reality of the world. This means that while they try and bridge the divide between the humanities and science, its philosophical deductions turn the real and real nature into a mere background for deconstructing, deconstructing the validity of the abstract perspective, or to, to demonstrating the validity of the abstract perspective or system of value. On top of this, new materialisms and new ontologies keep the postmodern legacy alive by continuing to find an ethical solution to the political problem of climate collapse. They limit action to a renewed politics of performative subversion simply with a materialist twist. Um, and they still try to keep their methods and community free from violence or involvement in violence. Its prescriptive ethics first approach has little con concern for whether and how it should emerge through the polis um, or if it can support effective political change. Its prescriptive totality is actually uninvested in democracy because it's already decided that its account of reality and how reality should be is correct. Um, and now it's just left for other people to come around to their perspective. So I, I argue that confronting the conditions of the Anthropocene requires a politics of intervention that this postmodern legacy simply can't support. Um, so it requires solidarity and new understandings of progress. Um, while Rose wasn't writing in a time that needed to confront environmental collapse, she was concerned with the stagnant limits of transcendentalism, um, not only how it protected its authority from being affected by reality, but how it failed to consider questions of its democratic emergence. Um, and so it was either politically passive or illiberal in nature, or both um, in the case of cultural dissemination. She particularly admires Hegel, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche and Freud as thinkers that grapple with the real difficulty of the modern condition who each suspend their ethical authority and inquiry without completely relinquishing it or giving up on the project of modernity. To develop her speculative method, Rose inserts Kierkegaard's notion of repetition forwards and Freud's notions of anxiety and working through into her reading of Hegelian dialectics, um, which is developed across her work, but um, culminates in her book, The Broken Middle, um, which was written in 1992. So as I'll explain in more detail, Rose's speculative method stands out in the way that it puts psychoanalytic self-work as a means to make philosophers answerable to reality, as a kind of precondition to reflection and to political action. Speculative negotiation is the approach she thought should have been used to work through any implication that Enlightenment philosophy may have had in the events of the Holocaust, to work through its violent actuality and accept the inevitable inevitable direction between the abstract and the real. Um, I realize that this talk probably should have been called sending the philosopher to therapy rather than sending the enlightenment to therapy because her approach is more about reading ourselves um, to progress politics and facing the unpredictable conditions brought about by modernity. The stance can better position philosophy to confront the drive to extinction because it would see the instances of the real exposed by climate events 
as opportunity to develop thought and politics in new direction as a kind of affirmation of a resignation. The method is less of a method and more of a call for philosophers to let go of the abstract, the constraints of abstract perfectionism, to embrace the wings of her angel, Angelus Dubius, the hybrid of humility, for who things go wrong, yet who still persists in the pain and staking itself, um, which can be compared to Walter Benjamin's traumatized angel of history. So the blue one's Angelus Dubius, who looks a bit more silly. It's worth mentioning that Rose's style is idiosyncratic and vague, um, and it's a style that allows the reader to take some authority over her meaning. But I think that this was intentional. Um, she saw Hegel and Kierkegaard as inviting her own active participation in their work, um, work that suspended their own authority and gave space for the emergence of her own unique ideas to emerge. So those less generous might see her loose interpretations as unfaithful readings of their work. Um, but I think it speaks to the way that she, privileged, that she privileges risk and failure over caution and stagnation. Before we go into more detail, um, it's important to describe like the radical reading of Hegel that grounds her position. So Rose <laughs> subscribes to the dialectical movement of thought in the world, but sees that movement being pushed by misrecognition rather than recognition. Um, in this reading, the social or physical world continuously interrupts and destabilizes thought. Rose thinks that our abstract world can never capture the real and full, the universe is boundless and collective and social life is full of competing opinions so that knowledge will be pervaded by mistakes and misconceptions. People are driven by an instinctive desire to understand the world but will be disproven again and again. Because the real is always in excess of the transcendental and misrecognitions are inevitable, the movement of concepts and negotiation with our experiences of these shortcomings should be ongoing. Each concept will eventually become mismatched by its object, which will again will demand a recognition. Each contradiction inspires a resolution, but her absolute or synthesis can only be described in her terms as comical. The absolute is comical because she thinks that while the dialectical opposites need to be held together to progress each side, their disunity at the same time can never come together. Um, so we see this in the example of the abstract and the actual that can never be reconciled. The progression of thought, as we'll see, is therefore not teleological, but driven by the surprises presented by the world. Concepts in the world, um, this is a quote, are full of surprises of unanticipated happenings so that comprehension is always provisional and preliminary. For Rose, when our worldview is torn apart, the theorist can respond in a way that affirms the moment of nihilism and the lessons that come with it, or deny it. Western philosophy, as we've seen, has been marked by a deep fear of the real. Um, whenever the symbolic breaks down, philosophy has done whatever it can to put the pieces of a complete cosmological picture back together, defensively denying the limits of thought and holding on to standards of perfection. The postmodern response to the failures of enlightenment promises demonstrated this deep unwillingness to sit with nihilism. Instead of facing the breakdown of meaning, philosophers often deflect by blaming others or the failed philosophy in question. Why is it, she asks, this is a quote, that a perceived drawback, whether in reason or truth or welfare, results in the apparently wholesale rejection of the principle involved? However, running away from the broken space of reality means a missed opportunity to reflect on philosophy's role in domination and how it's reproduced. She writes, this is a quote again, it is the philosophers terrified of their own inner insecur insecurities at the border between rationality and conflict who would leave us resourceless to know the difference between fantasy and actuality. Rosa's speculative method therefore starts by urging theorists not to rush to explain away the situation when cosmology is break down. What she calls negative capability, um, a willingness to sit with the discomfort of not having all the answers. 
Her famous, her most famous quote tells us to keep your mind in hell and despair not. Rose's approach therefore begins with a call to both accept the finitude of thought, as well as an inquiry into why we seek to deny that gap. What would philosophy look like if we acknowledged the limits, if we acknowledged its limits? Rose insists that remaining in the space of broken meaning will expose the inevitable disjuncture between all ideals and political practice that necessitates the failure of the abstract, not just for the theory in question. But properly analyzing the breakdown will also make the distinction between perpetrators and victims much less clear. So rather than turning outwards in blame, in moments of antithesis, Rose wants the theorist to look inwards at how we might be perpetrating the problem that we're blaming others for. Grappling with the finitude of thought in moments of broken meaning should emphasize that even if one has good intentions, the practice of any ideal will likely be filled with mistakes and exclusions. Ideals won't behave as we would anticipate in the mess of politics. Such implicating analysis troubles the scapegoating practice that is for the constructive development of thought and politics. She thinks that if postmodern theorists have paused for a moment and properly analyzed the space between enlightenment resources and their actuality, as well as their implication in that relation, Rose argues they would have seen that it wasn't the promise of enlightenment that failed, but our inability to account for and adapt to differences in its practice. She writes, reason and modernity cannot be said to, to have broken the promise of universal that thought. Reason and modernity cannot be said to have broken the promise of universality unless we have not kept it. For it is only we who can keep such a promise by working our abstract potentiality into the always difficult but enriched actuality of our relations to ourselves and to others. Rose insists that such moments of suspended or unsettled meaning can demonstrate that the way one theorizes with certainty or uncertainty can mean the difference of whether an ideal becomes domineering or is able to contribute to a more just democratic way of theorizing. This means that for her, deconstruction holds, the destruction holds lessons for comprehension of the modern condition. Rose therefore wants us to move back, backwards to this breakdown between enlightenment promises and its reality to repeat forward differently, to break from the fate that post-structuralism sealed by refusing to acknowledge their own violence. We need to move past repressing our implication in societal violence and make theory accountable to its unintentional outcomes. Rose acknowledges the bravery of dwelling in the abyss for it goes against a deep instinctive desire to flee from it. Here we have to move without the anchors that ground our being all the concepts and symbolic systems that gave our life meaning, that told us who we are and situated our existential and political place in the world. We'll say that nothing in life is secure. Yet acceptance of such anxiety is essential for breaking philosophy from its stuck fate. So Rose follows negative capability with positive capability a take on Freud's notion of working through that describes the movement from loss to a reintegration into political life. Working through starts with an acceptance of loss that accepts the finitude of thought, the inevitability of violence and the loss of identity of the unsettled concepts. Um, and it adjusts, the, it adjusts the concepts based on our lessons of, our, of their experience. She thought that postmodernism underappreciated how much the principles of universalism, metaphysics, reason, and the law were all important to democratic freedom and effective political change. So what would these look like if we accepted their finitude and failure? Rose thinks that if philosophers accept that the real is excessive to thought, the nature of theorizing will change to develop in response to real experiences. So first she argues that the finitude of thought implicates each theorist to make theory accountable to practice. A theorist who stays in the space of suspended meaning, who analyzes injustice 
injustices in a way that looks at their own implicity, comes to learn that will, action, reflection, and passivity have consequences for others. Rather than falling trap to false promises of how a new philosophy could hold the solution to the ills of society, we will see the importance of reworking the borders of what actually exists. So it invites the theorists to incorporate their experiences of actuality of the concept back into the concept itself, making what exists accountable to experience. So it does this slower, difficult labor of change, slowly but surely challenging the borders of concepts based on their shortcomings and implication and harm. This process also takes the theorist to the site of real politics. Speculative negotiation will send the theorist to seek answers in the real because such a process will show that we can't find all the answers in the abstract. We need to test out our ideals to learn more deeply about them through practice. But more than this, when we realize that we've, we're already implicated in the structures of political life, whether we've been active or passive, Rose thinks that the theorists will be pressed to fight for justice in real world politics. This is a quote. Um, it is this witness alone, this always already knowing, yet being willing to stake oneself again, that prevents oneself from becoming an arbitrary perpetrator or an arbitrary victim, that prevents one, actively or passively, from acting with arbitrary violence. Second, speculative negotiation releases philosophy from the repression and standards of absoluteness that were blocking its development. Anxiety is freedom's possibility because it is only a readiness for unknowing, for being in the original state of anxiety, that we can allow philosophy to move past progressive narrations and ask what may be ventured, knowing that there are no predetermined, clear-cut explanations for why an ideal failed or how we should move forward. Such pathlessness might seem daunting, um, but she points out that fixation on the right way forward has not served the political practice of philosophy well. This letting go of attachments to what a concept should be releases its development to change in ways that one wouldn't have anticipated. So in other words, it frees philosophy to risk and change. This is a quote. Anxiety charts the oscillation between self-destruction and risking one's life, between destruction and creation. This oscillation in anxiety is the education of existence, which therefore is not prior to concept, institution, or ethic, but is the existential falling towards and away from the middle itself. For education is the experience of the concept, institution, or law. So in Rose's approach, we must welcome what has been lost for what can be gained. This means that while the labor of change demands taking a clear metaphysical stand, um, acknowledging that there's no right way forward offers a facetious nature to its stance. So it asks us to kind of throw our trust behind ourselves, with it, which at the same time is committed to a higher order uncertainty, um, which I think can be contrasted with the post-structuralist facade of fluid perspectives that disguise a higher order of self-certainty. This kind of philosophy requires to a leap of faith because we must risk, risk forward into the unknown, knowing too that the implications might, might not be as we anticipate. Um, so let's look at an example of her own negotiated concept. Postmodernism was left traumatized with reason, but it didn't acknowledge for how reason is needed to tell the difference between fantasy from actuality. Reason is the resource that allows us to judge when a concept has failed and how to act. Reason, she argues, was not adequate, adequately described when characterized as dualistic, dominant, and imperialistic. It was only demonized. Yet reason doesn't have to be instrumental. We don't have to pursue cold facts for other means. I mean, means to other ends. She negotiates reason with her own reflection on its shortcoming and reconceives it as relational, responsive, and reconstructive that is used to relearn what we already know and to open each concept to the surprises of the real as well as to the sum of different perspectives. 
This negotiation of ideals and politics gives theorizing a resolutely democratic nature. Through challenging and reshaping existing political norms, ideals, and laws, one will have to face competing claims of concepts in politics. Putting ideals into practice and coming up against the competing perspectives will again expose the comic mismatch between concepts and their unanticipated outcomes, which will again present a moment where our systems of meaning are suspended, um, a kind of instance of antithesis, requiring again that, um, an adjustment of the abstract in light of the real. Um, so it can be seen as sort of self-interrupting. We will witness firsthand how each ideal fails and excludes. Um, so again, recognizing our direct implication and structures of societal misrecognition will reinforce the importance of taking a normative stand in politics, to, despite the likelihood of failures. This is a quote. Um, Learning in this sense mediates the social and the political. It works precisely by making mistakes, by taking the risk of action, and then re by reflecting on its unintended consequences, and then taking the risk yet again of further action, and so on. So theorists thus need to make mistakes to progress. This agonistic process of, negotiation, of negotiating ideals contributes to what Rose calls a comical universal, which represents the sum of people's real experiences um, of suffering or of experiencing the failure of the abstract um, and their attempts to incorporate those experiences into collective structures. So Rose's re-envisioning of the universal is comical and escapes the totalizing character of enlightenment proper. Because she sees universalism as a necessary optimism to facilitate the struggle over its moving parts, yet impossible given the difference between different experiences and opinions. It must be acknowledged that greater comprehension and innovation comes with the potential to cause harm a simultaneous acknowledgement and containment of human destructiveness and human creativity. Yet Rose, Rose would tell us that a life that renounces reason, oops, that renounces innocence and takes risks usually ends up being richer than one that clings to certainty. Only having the courage to keep our hearts open in the great abyss of the universe can we facilitate a substantial progress of politics, thought, and the self. So to conclude, this progress opens theory to development, um, but it's more concerned with developing a more rounded, accountable, plural understanding of concepts, which require an ongoing relearning of what we already think we know. It moves backwards and forwards, preparing the soul for the anxiety of the unknown and for the courage to move forward without clear anchors or paths, free falling into the restlessness of existence. Speculative negotiation, as we see, does not create enclosed abstract universes that seek to replace the real, but tries to submit thought to the real. Her account includes examples of how progress, universalism, and reason can be reconceived. But her account is more of a long-winded way of inviting philosophers to try and rethink philosophical resources that have been effective for political change in the past adjusting them to acknowledge their finitude, implication and harm and acceptance of vulnerability. Rose's approach is definitely not without flaws. Um, so primarily she embeds Hegelian assumptions at the core of her approach, um, such as the intersubjective, intersubjective notion of misrecognition that makes the theorist feel responsible for moving from negative to positive capability which means that there's a kind of self-fulfilling teleology to it. Connected to this, um, there is threat that synthesizing our experiences of the real into the abstract reduces the real to a philosophical interpretation of it. Again, giving authority to meaning and threatening to subjectivize nature, um, what Katerina and Laurel call an amph amphibology. On top of this, practically speaking, it's hard to imagine how this would work in practice. Um, I feel like she's writing from a more sheltered perspective 
that has not comprehended what it means to completely let go of caution um, and how mistakes can be grave. Um, and she has perhaps an unrealistic faith in people's judgments. Nonetheless, I feel like she invites a boldness and courage to philosophy that has somehow been lost, making it worthy of adaptation. I think that Rose's call for theorists to prepare themselves for the discomfort of meaninglessness is more important than ever and can maybe better enable philosophy to grapple with science's findings. And it is a confrontation of the real, followed by a will to integrate those experiences into philosophical and political structures that can hopefully um, grapple with the with, that can hopefully change them to grapple with the reality of climate collapse and not just passively wait for its arrival. Not requiring us to give up progress, to, but to make it more aware of its destruction. So I hope to repurpose speculative negotiation to confront the anti-anthropocentric lessons exposed by climate science in the real and to fold those lessons back into the absolute, stripping the enlightenment of regression in its humanist remain. Um, so I feel like I don't have quite as much expertise as Katerina and Frank, um, especially in relation to um, this conference topic. Um, so I thought it might be more productive to have a kind of half discussion, half Q&A. Um, and I'd love to hear about whether this region has also experienced the effects of this idea of um, communism being replaced by community. Um, so it's kind of completely taken over the left in Australia and New Zealand and the States and England, I'm pretty sure. Um, I feel like it's given the left a slightly illiberal nature um, and that everyone's self-policing. Um, and I feel like it's just a pretty big crisis of our age and no one's really talking about it. I've never been in, in an academic context where we have been able to talk about it. Um, so I, I would be really interested to have a discussion on that. Um, and maybe where people think it came from and how we can move forward. And, um, whether there, anyone has any examples of like new iterations of solidarity or just I'm a little bit clueless on what to do, but I'd love to have a conversation about it. Yep. So would you like us to respond to this or would you take questions first? Um, I think we can do it combined, just whatever people feel like. Um, uh, what, what second? Uh, Yeah. So, I have two questions. I'll turn to you three because they're a bit insane and not sensible. Um, so, the destruction of the world, nature, humanity, animals, everything in itself is a form of greed, not greed in the literal sense, but greed and the desire to touch the real, which always inevitably leads to a downward spiral, a spiral emotional death, anxiety, and dread. Like in Crime and Punishment, when this chemical uh, kills the old woman, he spirals because he quote unquote touches the real that can never be touched. Um, so in that way, it is Thanatos. Uh, 
but Anathos, for me at least, is predominantly a lack of passion and constant repetition of a passionless act. Mm -hmm. So is one thing to touch the real a lack of passion is my first question. And is, it, is one thing to touch the real, to reach the real a lack of passion is my first question. And my second question would be about purifying the world. Uh, purifying the world is fueled by a desire to kill the real. And my question is, why is there a, at the same time a desire to touch, grasp the real, and a desire to kill the real? Um, can we return to your first question? What do you mean by um, wanting to touch the real? Is it like to grasp it, to get to it, to experience mm. the real, which can never be experienced in the Lacanian terms, real? Mm. Um, well, in some senses, I think that um, we do experience in the real in um, moments of passion, like um, Katerina's work, for instance, talks about the more like um, affective um, state of the real. So um, quite often, um, passion would be equated with the real. But I think that the, um, the lack of wanting to touch the real in the environmental sense is kind of like more of a... Um, we're just falling into these symbolic cosmologies that are told to us by capitalism and that are kind of reformed by um, philosophy and so on that uh, have nothing to do with passion. Um, and there is, I don't know, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. And what was the second question? Um, well, you spoke about the need to purify the world. Um, uh, yeah, so. In my opinion, purifying the world is fueled by a desire to kill the real. And why is do humans have the desire to kill the real? Is it because it's ungraspable? Um, well, that's a super difficult question. Like I've been trying to think about why we had this desire to kill the real um, for I don't know a year or two, and I can't really like um, work out the answer for it. Um, but I think. Um, it, there's just like a simple relation in that like we create these these symbolic um, fantasies um, and we invest so much in them um, and they, they structurally rely on denying materiality um, and denying the real because the real will always show that they are just a fantasy um, so there's this um, we have an investment in trying to um, destroy the real which used to it used to be destroying the real in a kind of symbolic sense but now it's like in a quite literal sense um but it's a good question like uh i actually was going to write a section on that in this talk and i was like mm, i don't actually know the answer but it's the most important question to my thesis for sure <laughs> yeah um well um, Jeff, uh, two questions. First, the first one is the interruption of your requirements for the discussion. Do you have a way that communism sometimes was replaced by uh, society? So, yes, uh, structure is theory of the biblical For example, uh, uh, Abraham uh, Leach, in his uh, structurist interpretation of the biblical lead, he says that. Uh, Actually, Christianity originated from common yadas on uh, Hebrew that means gatherings. And uh, then there was a collection of decision making here. In other words, the main tool of the uh, socialist uh, uh, politics or uh, society, uh, the self government. And uh, so this called uh, gatherings, common yadas. Uh, it's also like communism, and even it sounds it sound, uh, the same. So, keeping the end notes of his, uh, uh, he's keeping that this is a continuation from this time because uh, uh, Jesus was again uh, a taxation because they, they actually, according to the structures in the application, they tried to kill him because he wanted a merchant not because the, there was a crisis, and they think that uh, he think that they shouldn't pay uh, 
the plate of merchandise on the T square. And uh, so this, this is the one, uh, but uh, it is considered to be a structure. I mean, yeah, I think uh, it focused on the most structure. Uh, uh, and uh, the second, uh, so how do you find uh, this situation? Combinator versus which uh, uh, the Nordic concept is actually practiced. So, because mm -hmm. they have very, very, historically, they have very, uh, very uh, strong winters and they have to have uh, to organize themselves in the groups. Very similar to the to have a lot of food and maybe help in the winter. So in a way, the climate and the geography is forcing them to be a sort of communist society. And uh, the second question is, uh, I, I wonder why did you say that uh, about the post structures? Because on the contrary, post structuralists um, uh, pointed directly to this connection of the melancholy of the whole house and the destruction of the of the environment and the ecology uh, and uh, also hermeneutics interpretation is confirming this one for example uh, uh, Berjad in uh, General Berjad in Russia he uh, proclaimed Jews are threatening the uh, communist society and he said that all, all, all Jews must be without jobs and he let them of all four million of them in communist uh, Russia, because he, he was a general, he beat the Nazis in the Stalingrad battle, and then he was very strong in the decision making. And actually, this law still exists in Russia. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so why do you think that uh, there isn't this uh, post structure? And for example, also this. Um, uh, the most famous uh, Bulgarian post structuralist, what was his name? Well, it was uh, writing on so the one, uh, the, 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 yes, he pointed out that uh, also communism has concentration games in order to to uh, support its authoritarianism. So on the contrary, I think that uh, portrayalism is very much in, in this line. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not just. I just um maybe want to clarify when I say when I'm asking about whether. Your reading is um, experiencing um, the replacement of communism by community. It's not necessarily liberal. It's more like the movement of um, political action or um, displays of politics from the political sphere to the more cultural sphere. So, um, you know, an example of, of um, community politics would be like um, performative displays of identity through social media or something, as opposed to New, new coming, new like solidarity with new forms of community, um, which yeah yeah. yeah. Um, I think that we are mimicking all these models. You know, the model of civil society as understood as practiced in the West, uh, the model of democracy, parliamentary democracy, as we see it modeled upon uh, the contemporary. European Union states and uh, uh, the principles, let's say, the, the main value, political value tenets of the European Commission and so on, which is technocratic body. So, anyway, after the, the dissolution of the Federation, which was social federation in Yugoslavia, and the change of regime, so uh, the emergence of the new political and economic system, we uh, found ourselves in a period which was called, this was, you know, the term of uh, address to us, to us by the Western European states, states uh, uh, stating that we were in a state of transition. We were transitioning for a decade or two, we have been transitioning from communist authoritarian states to democrat, democratic societies. So to democracy and free market economy. So in this period, we have been learning to mimic uh, the mores of you know, the Western democracies. Uh, uh, so this includes states, society, 
civil society and how it acts. But I think that there the has been also emerged from the previous system. So community, the notion of community does not have that role or that meaning as in the West. Um, we, can, uh, uh, we can speak of, for example, or in the Commonwealth, the society, right? Uh, Margaret Thatcher's society. Um, uh, therefore, it's kind of less different from the community of uh, communality or whatever. We don't really have that because we haven't had that replacement of categories. And um, other systems, even you we know, uh, institutional structures of the same kind. So while we may mimic, uh, mimic the installation of the Western system, which you could, could suppose the, the state and how society is being construed or being practiced, 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 or it's also practiced the society. While we mimic that, I think that we also drag some remnants from the previous uh, system. Uh, for example, we still have uh, parts of healthcare. You know, okay, there is private participation, but that's really nothing even for profit. So uh, there's so many things that kind of go without saying that were introduced from the previous system. My point here is, uh, whatever may belong to the community is supposed to be the task of the state, and this is inherited from before. Then. Uh, practicing solidarity, practicing being a community through the form of, let's say, civil society organization here is more, more heavily political, less uh, communal, charity centered, uh, solidarity centered than in the West. Here, activism is more political. I would say this is a big answer based, based on. Personal experiences, I, I'm not sure if everybody agrees with this. Yeah, I would say it's definitely more policy based, it's not political in terms of what civil society organizations do. Um, however, I also want to try to be as concrete as possible, mm -hmm. but I wanted to shift the, the mm -hmm. words Isidora's topic about uh, grappling with the real and how we touch it. Um, I think it's also important to this, maybe a notion typical for the West of having this simple flesh. And mm. the spirit and the soul that tends to be, you know, at a higher order of standing. Actually, some months ago, I was reading a book on theology. It was a master's thesis. And the author was making a comparison between how the thinkers of the Reformation, like Calvin and Luther, uh, came up with very similar ideas to those exhibited by the Orthodox fathers of the church before the great schism happened. And that was really interesting because they are stressed the, the, I mean, the author stressed the, uh, the fact that Christianity sees both the body and the spirit as equal because you know with the resurrection both of them rise not only not only one. Um, my my main response was towards this idea of communism and community uh, should be treated. This is also a question, but I'm it's biased by my own opinion. Should be treated as the reaction towards the individualistic tendencies of neoliberalism where alienation has happened, society has become a lot more stratified. So should we see this as a, as a simple reaction? Because I've actually been reading on thinkers from the right even, who now advocate for more communitarianism, for more community-based approaches, for more collectivism in a sense, rather than the sheer individualism. And then my second question is, um, yeah. Can you repeat the, the question again, sorry? So, should we treat uh, this idea of community replacing the, the political system as a reaction towards the individualistic tendencies of neoliberalism, in a sense? Um, yes, I think so. I, um, I think it, um, it's more like, um, at least what my talk was trying to get at is the way so that... Do you mind for the my question? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, what was the question, sorry? 
about the postcard tourism because they were also uh, in the council of communism, they were the same society almost as the Marxist society. Yeah. And then they have concentration again, and then they they uh, wait for whatever the life of the society and the future of the world. Because you said that uh, they couldn't, but I think on the contrary, that they, they were most successful in the uh, Defining the eventually the better equal, equal models of equal social models. Mm. Or oh, why you say that they could they were unable to define this similarity? And uh, the first question was uh, about the Christianity and the community thing. So mm. like she said, the communities and the because uh, uh, you said where well, they will be placed by the community. I think that this is the, uh, let's say, in the new text, I'm going to have Gordon Traveler come with this structure, this interpretation of the biblical community. Um, well, I have no idea, to be honest. Um, yeah, I don't know. Does anyone have any ideas how to respond to the questions? Okay, we're um, going to think about it. Okay. Uh, we can talk about it that later, but I'm, um, yeah, my, um, yeah, my, my knowledge of religious community, everything is not, it's not very, um, yeah, I'd love to take this over later though. <laughs> um, and now I've forgotten your question. <laughs> <laughs> so in a sense, we were discussing whether this shift towards community is a temporal reaction. What's, what's happened in the 80s and the 90s. Oh, yeah, yeah. I definitely, I definitely think it is. And it's like, it's an, I think um, they're both tied to this. I think that the the new the new sort of like um, community, if we're talking about kind of like this identity politics community. Yeah, um, tribe, yeah, yeah tr this tribal like um, symbolic system, I think is like very much tied into, like feeds back into um, capitalist fantasies as well. Um, and they they both just like um, try and create these fantasies and do whatever they can to um, make sure that they those fantasies are protected from any challenge and they just become more and more solid and concrete. And so I think that a way to break those apart would be to um, yeah, like just retouch ourselves with the body and with the real and um, so that they, aren't as concrete as we would like to think like those fantasies are just fantasies they're not just um everyone's reality and i think what rose gets at is they that those enclosed fantasies are um they can't be democratic because they because they're, they're just they're just structured to um keep that perspective in place like there's no there's no want to um have it challenged or, or have it receptive to other ways of being. Does it actually answer your question? Yeah, in a way, no, in a way it's also reductionist and, 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 and a sort of generalization. So I was speaking about it yesterday at the, at the Katarina's lecture in terms of having this, uh, the way values and identities and culture are becoming increasingly more important. So even minuscule aspects, trivial aspects of life, how they become politicized. And I also think that it contributes towards the stifling of academic debate. Yeah. When it's so much about who you are instead of what you think. Yeah. And, and stuff like that. My second question, which is more like a request for explanation. So uh, you quoted Rose here uh, that we should make theory more accountable to its unintentional implications. Mm. Philosophy. Philosophy, yeah. Let me correct my notes. Mm. Make philosophy more accountable towards its unintentional mm. implications. What does that mean in a sense? Um, so she thinks that um, basically the, the um, um, just because the um, the social sphere um, is made up by plur plurality of people, um, when you try and practice any ideal, um, the plurality is going to kind of take it in ways that you didn't intend. Um, so, like even if you have the most perfect um, theory or ideal, um, it's going to look very different in practice. So by making it accountable 
this is like the, the key relationship she thinks um, that needs to be accounted for between philosophy and the abstract is um, to just become aware of the fact that every single ideal is going to um, have unintended consequences and also might be exclusive to some people. And so she thinks that this method that I was describing is to then um, try and reincorporate to and to just um, when when our ideals um, don't have the behaviors we anticipate in politics, to take a moment and kind of reflect on them and then um, adjust the ideal based on how it kind of like went astray. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah, so, so it should just think that everything that um, theory should be done is a way that um, is a feedback between political practice and reflecting on just think that all ideals will fail. Um, so we've seen, you know, like the example of let's say like post-structuralism developed this kind of like ethics of total inclusion but in practice is it um, 40, 50 years down the line. Um, it's a pretty uninclusive sexuality. Um, but she thinks if there had been maybe been a bit more feedback between um, observing the reality of those exclusions um, and maybe adapting the theory based on that. Thank you. <laughs> something, something. Uh, it might uh, not seem so self evident to everybody here uh, that philosophy should own its faults in uh, practice. Uh, the effect it's that it has on, you know, real life uh, and the political and uh, other types of social practice. It might not seem so self-evident to everybody because it may be a contested statement or, um, uh, you know, it may be arguable to many or far from self-evident that self-evident that philosophy has any effect whatsoever on the life, the real life we uh, live in. Um, the it, uh, general view is that philosophy is something ethereal, detached from political practice, detached from institutional practices, etc., etc., and would of course have absolutely no effect whatsoever on uh, the reality we inhabit. Uh, so Rose departs from the thesis that it actually does and it always already has had effect. Well, this can be, this can be further accentuated by François Orwell's uh, theory that the world we inhabit uh, equals to us. Basically, uh, it, uh, this is far from something that the world would endorse or agree with the, the, the following phrasing, but I will use it in order to simplify uh, the point. It's like uh, radicalizing to the extreme uh, Foucault's thesis that we inhabit a certain discursive universe. Uh, the world says there is nothing outside, just like Foucault in a way, nothing outside this uh, world of beliefs, as he calls it philosophy. Uh, because there are different types of discourse, there is scientific discourse, there is arts, which are according to him, um, less detrimental to uh, the reality, uh, political, social, economic reality we inhabit than philosophy. Philosophy is the most pretentious without taking any responsibility for its pretentious claims. It kind of postulates what the reality should be and then expects reality to fit this posture. And we have lived uh, in, a, in worlds like this since always basically. And what is modernity? The, isn't the modern state, um, the modern civilization basically based on the premises of the Enlightenment and Immanuel Kant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, wasn't USSR ran from the beginning, uh, also from a body called the Epistemic com uh, Committee of the Communist Party of USSR. So, uh, so they postulate what's real, what's not, basically ontology, uh, metaphysics is, uh, uh, controlled, like in medieval scholastic time. In other words, uh, uh, philosophy has actually always molded uh, the reality we inhabit, and that's why Leroux equates uh, philosophy and the world as the monde, where they call the capital uh, W. Uh, so 
intermediate stream and the root stream and this other author cited is that the philosophy does have an effect and should you know own its effects. Yeah, this is why she makes a distinction between what she calls um like passive philosophy and active philosophy. So she thinks um philosophy has always already been implicated in the shape of the world and in violence, and it kind of just um pretends it doesn't, but it still it takes on it, it seeps out and it takes on effect. And um, like we see with let's say with post-structuralism, um, but she wants to make a shift from active to passive. Hmm? Well, humanism now, now is yeah. it, like I don't think we've seen quite the full effects of it, but it's yeah. become this new consciousness that everyone has subscribed yeah. subscribe to. Um, you can't. There's no. There's no space for it being wrong because there's only space for people to slowly start to agree with this conception of the world. Um, so Rose invites us to kind of break these um, hegemonies apart and um, just make philosophy more accountable. More active, she says. And, and I think also in a sense that the idea of philosophy being retired in the abstract is also engraved in the collective subconscious, or let's say just the collective mentality, you know, all these jokes about philosophers only thinking and doing nothing, etc. when they actually did the reality is something completely different. Uh, yeah, this is just the Marxist uh, theory or uh, posture that philosophy participates in uh, the world its uh, ideologies is the foundation of ideologies, and it is also a Marxist way, or of the same of these other philosophers as well. Uh, post structuralists are strangely the most influential and uh, the most oblivious of their role, which is very strange. Uh, but uh, let's recall uh, Foucault and his theology of knowledge and the equation uh, between power discourse and episteme. Basically, episteme legitimates uh, uh, form, uh, forms a certain form of, uh, let's say, dominant discourse, and dominant discourse justifies and shapes political power. So episteme, epistemology, power, discourse are equated. This is if we we would yes, uh, power is not just power, it's be a power. So then I think it's a one. Okay, it's a different thing. A different book. Um, and it's uh, the reading of Adam. Uh, now I'm referring to Foucault's structuralist writings. He prepares himself to be a structuralist, not for structure. Uh, like, uh, what Memoria shows, what was the word in the state in English? Uh, the, this book was called Memoria shows the word that's in South Archaeology of Bonus, maybe? No, that was another one. Uh, but this one is also just a difference with some kind of archaeology the title. I know the title is there. So it begins like this is a structural account of this and this and this. He excavates there the um, relevance of the role, a uh, very tangible, easily detectable role of the enlightenment on um, how the world has been shaped since the enlightenment. Um, so you, you, you've got even that. That's my, my point. It's not such an isolated idea that uh, yeah. plays a, a role. If historically, but Irish sort of played a tremendous role. Mm -hmm. As a philosopher and that with Alexander the Great being mm -hmm. it's a direct link. But they, they rule ancient Athens even without yeah. being rule, rulers. Yeah. If you postulate uh, what's good, what's bad, what's moral acceptable, what isn't, what's good art, what isn't good art, um, uh, what is good politics and what isn't, and this was the task of the philosophers in ancient Athens. Then they don't have to be rulers. They already rule because um, the rulers uh, rule according to these precepts. So it's. Uh, and also coming yeah. back to your um, question of accountability, Rose kind of thinks that um, unless philosophy starts to become accountable um, to itself, this um, illiberal or totalitarian structure um, in dissemination to culture is just going to repeat. Doesn't matter quite what the philosophy is. 
you know, next it might be post-humanism that is 10, 20 years from now, um, you know, equally ethical, um, definitely have a care for um, the environment and for human relations, but without this sort of accountability and, and actually um, taking a look inwards at how their theory is manifesting in the world, it's again just going to repeat this um, illiberal way of doing, of theorizing. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We can discuss. Not there is no barrier, no question in the Zoom room. Uh, thank you, Amelia. Uh, we can continue uh, during the lunch. Uh, the lunch? Yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, 2.15, 15, we have uh, the student presentation. Thank you. Yeah.